are about to go on. Because everything is going all Sir Garnet. Going all Sir Garnet, or things were all Sir Garnet, was a a phrase in the Victorian era that knew, meant everything was going according to plan. And that is all due to the career and the reputation of Sir Garnet Wolseley, who everything went according to plan. In fact, you could call him the very model of a modern major general. Because in Gilbert and Sullivan's Pirates and Penzance, which came out in 1880, um, the major general was based on Sir Garnet. He rose to prominence, uh, served in, uh, in the Crimea and in the Indian Mutiny. Between Wolseley and Lord Roberts over there, you can trace every major British army conflict, uh, nearly every British major army conflict in the latter half of the Victorian era. Now, Wolseley was in command in the uh, Ashanti expedition. He took over the uh, Anglo-Zulu War, though he never, he, by the time he had arrived, most everything was in hand. Now, we can look at the back of his plinth as a veritable CV of all of his campaigns. The, we have Field Marshal Viscount Wolseley, KP, GCB, OM, GCMG. 1833 to 1913, Commander-in-Chief of the British Army from 1895 to 1900 in the middle of the World War. Now, these three, he was rather young, uh, Burma, Crimea, and the Indian Mutiny. Um, he was on the staff in the Crimea, in the uh, China Expedition, the Taku Forts. It's actually fascinating how many joint Anglo-French operations there are in the 19th century. I suppose you keep your friends close and your enemies closer. And here Wolseley was depicted under fire attempting to uh, repair a bridge during the assault on the Taku Forts in 1860. He was at the Red River Expedition in Canada. Now the Red River Expedition, sometimes known directly as the Wolsey Expedition, and this was in response to the Red River Rebellion, which was begun by the Métis people which are mixed indigenous and European, mostly French. In the Red River colony, Louis Riel began the rebellion to throw off British Canadian rule, and the Wolsey expedition was sent to assert Canadian federal dominance there. The rebellion was dispersed and Louis Riel had to flee to the United States, but eventually the colony would be recognized and join the Canadian Confederation as the province of Manitoba. And he actually had been sent to Canada in 1861 um, during the Trent Affair, when America and Britain nearly went to war. He was one of the officers sent to command in Canada, should war have broken out between the US and Great Britain. And when war didn't break out, he actually got permission to go observe the Union Army. Um, as, as we discussed, probably not thoroughly impressed, but um, he, did, uh, he did observe at, in an official capacity, unlike Colonel Fremantle, who needed to do everything incognito. Of course, if you're interested in the Trent Affair or the foreign observers of the Civil War, uh, we have some great videos we've done previously on those. Then, the expedition against the Ashanti. Now, the Ashanti expedition, which is officially the third Anglo-Ashanti war, began when the British purchased the Dutch Gold Coast in West Africa, and the Ashanti didn't recognize that transfer and invaded from the inland. Sir Garnet's expedition was sent into the interior in search of the Ashanti capital. They very methodically moved through the dense terrain. They finally reached the capital, Kamasi, 
laid waste to the town and blew up the palace. They eventually, after defeating the Ashanti in the field, secured a number of treaties, but there would be two further Anglo-Ashanti wars in 1896 and between 1900 and 1903, and eventually there would be a stronger hold over the British Gold Coast, and that would later become Ghana. Citizens of the new state of Ghana gather for the celebration marking their day of freedom from colonialism. What was once the Gold Coast, a British colony, now becomes an independent commonwealth. Uh, South Africa, and uh, in 1879, taking over um, for Lord Chelmsford after everything had already been well in hand. Egypt in 1882, after the British and the French deposed the Khedive Ishmael Pasha and replaced him with Taufik Pasha, there was a revolt by Egyptian army officers, and it seems no matter what year it is, there's always a uh, revolt by Egyptian army officers um, called the Urabi Revolt. And this Anglo-Egyptian war was to support the Khedive and to put down the Urabi Revolt. In fact, the British soldiers that served in that campaign received the Khedive Star from the Khedive. Now, Wolsey famously smashed the Egyptians at Tel El Kabir, and ultimately the Khedive was restored in Egypt, the revolt was put down, and permanent British occupation began in Egypt and Sudan. Now, in 1884, we have the Modest Revolt, and that's the second Egyptian campaign noted here on the plinth. A Sufi leader named Muhammad Ahmad, calling himself the Mahdi, the rightly guided one, started a major rebellion in Sudan. Now, an Anglo-Egyptian force went down into Sudan to put down the revolt. One of the main commanders was um, Charles Gordon, Chinese Gordon, a British soldier who was hired by the Egyptians. And we know that the Egyptians do that quite often, hiring foreign mercenaries, professional soldiers, to bolster their army, including many of the um, uh, American Civil War veterans who arguably did not do so well when they uh, were fighting in Egyptian service. Now, an Anglo-Egyptian force is smashed at Abu Klea. The British Square, the famous British Square, is broken, and Gordon holds out in a siege in the capital of Khartoum. And a relief force under Wolseley is sent towards Sudan from Lower Egypt. And they actually get there two days too late. General Gordon, or Gordon Pasha, as he was known in Egyptian service, was killed. And after attempting to move into the city, Wolseley actually retreats back into Egyptian-held territory. And an Islamic state exists in Sudan until the second Sudanese invasion by the British under Kitchener in 1898. The, the other thing I like to mention, always have to have some canon references. This statue, cast from the Medal of Guns, taken in Lord Wolseley's campaigns, was erected by public subscription, and um, we don't know which campaigns. Someone might know which campaigns, but somebody's guns were added to the medal for his statue. Between 1868 and 1874, we have the Cardwell reforms, which are named after the Secretary of State for War, Cardwell. And in 1884, those are followed up with very similar reforms by Childers. And both of these reforms focus on having localized regiments, meaning that you no longer have the numbered regiments, and that when you join the British Army in, say, your home county, you will serve with a home county regiment rather than running the risk of being assigned just anywhere. The Cardwell reforms also abolished flogging, finally, and withdrew troops from self-governing colonies. And it finally abolished the last purchasing of commissions. There were a number of 
reforms starting in the 1840s to curtail the sale of commissions and actually have it based on merit, but the last vestiges of the commission purchasing system were stamped out. Now these were followed up in 1881 with the Childers reforms, which went along the same lines as the Cardwell reforms, and also included a great deal of input from Sir Garnet. Going along those same lines, they reorganized a lot of the regiments, they introduced a new battalion system, and they also further incorporated the rifle volunteers into the structure of the army, actually using the various rifle volunteer corps as reserve battalions in the British Army, transitioning to what would eventually become the Territorial Army. And there were a lot of things that were just completely resisted, but Wolseley was very vocal in support of the reforms that the Army needed. Um, and he being one of the most experienced actual combat commanders, um, and actual field commanders in the field, um, he was very influential in getting those reforms pushed through. Um, the big opponent, of course, being uh, Prince George, Duke of Cambridge, who we've talked about before. Um, now again, interesting what they've chosen to portray him in, because he is in his full dress uniform with every order imaginable, and his big plumed hat, whereas Lord Roberts is dressed on campaign, which we shall see.